Everybody nod. It's this week in Jihad. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. We have here the world's greatest Christian apologist, Mr. D. Wood, and I am Robert Spencer, author of the Quran. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Wood, people say, you got to let David talk first, so have at it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you? Did you say everybody nod? It's time for jihad. That's what I said. <laughs> that's that's your catchphrase <laughs> for this week. Uh, you can uh, hey, you can do a new one each week, and then like have people uh, rate them, and you can yeah. uh, and then you can and you can say like, hey, pick your favorite one, and you'll you'll stick with your favorite one, and the winner uh, gets a critical Quran. Yeah, that'd be awesome. They'd love that. Yep. <laughs> so send in so, your uh, send in your suggestions, as well as your votes. Yes, David. So, plenty of jihad this week. Plenty of jihad. I've I've even seen it messing around on, and I and I was insanely busy recording episodes of Muhammad's Boom Boom Room, and I saw uh, I saw multiple. Um, again, not even paying attention, but just and certainly didn't see it on CNN or any anything else like that. Just people sending me, hey, check this out. So uh, I'm sure you're going to be talking about these. But, you know, the guy killing his parents in Nigeria. We have. Uh, hey, hey, do you know how to pronounce the word? I don't know if you know. You, well, no, I already know you know this. But <laughs> I mean, British people pronounce words more stupidly than French people, right? You think that that's impossible, right? But, uh, but so the, the video clip that's going around is like Muslims attacking Hindus in, it looks like Leicester, Leicester, something like that. But I know they're gonna have some dumb pronunciation for that. I, 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 know, there's, I know there's gonna be some ridiculous pronunciation that, that doesn't look like it at all. Why don't, you guys, why don't you guys give us a phonetic pronunciation for those of you who are from there. Tell us how to pronounce this word, and don't be messing with us and saying, "Oh, it's pronounced slub glob" and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> if we I'm not, know how to pronounce it. Uh, David, actually, if, if I'm not mistaken, I do believe it's Leicester. Yeah, Leicester. Yes. That's what I mean. Does it look like Leicester? Hey, British yeah. people, Leicester is L-E-S-T-E-R. <laughs> That's how you spell Leicester. Yes. And, that, and unless you're French or British, in which case you'll put like twenty extra letters in there. <clears throat> so anyway, in Leicester or wherever it is. Hey, you, wait, Andrew Martin Andrew Martin said Le it looks like Leicester. He that's said right. Leicester. That's actually how you say it, Andrew? Is that how you say it? Do you say do you pronounce it Leicester? Am I pronouncing it? No, oh, see wait, no. the Leicester. There we go. It is I thought oh, it was boy. Leicester. See, now we're getting conflicting reports. See, they don't even know how to pronounce their stupid words. Yes. All right. You know something? Actually, I know this from jazz. I just I just remembered that because you of course you know the jazz classic. Lester Young's showpiece, Lester Leaps In. And so there was a, uh, a live album not too long ago of a couple of very free jazz avant-garde guys playing in this Leicester, and it was called Leaps In Lester, which was a pun on Lester Leaps In, but it only works if that's how you pronounce the word. So, yeah, Lester. I, I, I would mess with that word differently if we're talking about Islam. I would rhyme Lester with molester, and all right, Mo, Lester, right? And then you could then you could you could talk about Muhammad there. You could talk about the grooming gangs. It, it's like a whole world of possibilities. So if Muhammad lived today, and or if he ever lived and lived in England, he would live in Leicester. Mm -hmm. Mo from Leicester, him, and they would call him Mo Lester. <laughs> All right. Yes, we have a call tonight from Mo and Lester. <laughs> he said, Allah Akbar. And anyway, uh, yes, married, in all seriousness. And married a, and married a six year old. Quite a lot of uh, unrest in Lester this week, as uh, apparently a uh, it was over the Asia Cup. I'm not even sure what sport that is. I guess soccer football football in Leicester and uh, they were fighting 
but the it started to be this sectarian thing with Muslim mobs attacking Hindus and attacking Hindu-owned properties, which is something that we see in India and in Pakistan as well. But now with uh, mass migration, we're here. It's in the UK, in Leicester itself. Wait, so so that was that was over sports? I figure I, I assumed it was over like them mad at someone in India making fun of Muhammad and because we've seen this over and over again where um, if one person from one group does things does something in one part of the world, it's supposedly fair game to attack anyone <laughs> from any related group anywhere in the world. We've seen that over and over again. Ah, look what Israel just did. Now we go attack Jews and so on. Um, and so, but man, that, that's even, that's even more messed up. If it was over. Yes. Here. Apparently it's a cricket, a cricket, cricket, game. cricket. Yes. Do you cricket know what cricket and is? Lester. Do you, yeah. Do you know it's, what cricket is? It's like baseball, only weird. <laughs> it, that's the one with a flat bat for some, yes. for some, for some reason for years when I heard them talking about cricket, <clears throat> I thought there were, I thought it was croquet, you know, you know, that backyard <laughs> game that people play. Yes. And then I saw them swinging an actual like flat bat one day, and I was like, "Hey, what is this?" Anyway, yeah. you know, I was actually uh, back uh, in the old days. I was in London, and went into a pub, and everybody was watching. Everybody's intent on this cricket match that was on the telly, and it was five hundred and thirty-eight to nothing. And I thought, "Well, you can hang this one up," <laughs> but they were all saying, "No, no, no! It's close. This is very close. Five hundred and thirty-eight to nothing." So, okay. I don't. I don't pretend to understand cricket. Well, at least they get some some bigger numbers than soccer, where it's like one zero, and that's a that's a blowout. Indeed, indeed. Uh, the uh, actually in the strictly organized categories this week, the mob violence in Leicester, with gang, according to one witness, gangs running riot, escalating attacks on Hindus, innocent Hindus terrorized in their own properties attempts to stab and rampant vandalism of Hindu properties. That is just one of many, unfortunately, violent jihad incidents this week. And so in keeping with our organization, we can go over to Egypt, where two Coptic Christians, Salama Musa Wahib and his son Hani, were shot dead by Islamic State jihadis in Sinai in al Kantara Shark in Midwest Sinai. They were working in their fields in farmland which they own in that area. And so this is uh, just a gratuitous attack on the part of the Islamic State jihadis. These people were killed because they were Christians. There is just no other explanation that can be given. In I gave a... Um, I, uh, I check, I check, I go to multiple news sites every day, whatever else has happened. It's like one of the first things I do, um, when I get up and, uh, and then multiple times per day. And I didn't hear one word about that. You're the first time, uh, hearing about it, but I guarantee you this, if it had been Christian shooting Muslims out there, we would have heard about it. It would have been, uh, trending everywhere. And it would have been a, uh, it had been a, a global news story about the persecution of, and, and the problem of Islamophobia. There ain't no doubt about it, David. And there's more like that. I'll bet you haven't heard this one either. In Germany, uh, a uh, gentleman named Nuradi A, they don't give the last names here in the German press when there's criminals, he went to Christopher Street Day, which is yet another gay pride event in Münster, which is hitherto known for its cheese, as far as I know. And uh, he, at this gay pride event, he attacked three lesbian women, insulted them as whores, was beating them up, and a transgender man actually, I'm not sure whether the transgender man was a man or a woman, but in any case, he uh, or she intervened and Narati beat him to death. And so here again, just as in Egypt, these people were uh, subjected to violence because they were Christians. And in Leicester, they were subjected to violence because they were Hindus. So also in Germany, they were subjected to violence because they were homosexuals, transgender, etc. All these groups being among those that 
the jihadis are specifically directed to fight against. Now, th- this one, this one is interesting. I did hear this one, but only because someone sent me mm-hmm. a link to your article on uh, Jihad Watch there. So uh, would not have had any clue. But Robert, we're, we're kind of used to them not reporting um, violence against really any non-Muslim group in Africa, right? People just don't report what happens mm-hmm. in Nigeria and you know other places uh, there. Uh, but I mean, if anything, we're going to break through the media's protection of this ideology. Don't you think it would be an attack on multiple LGBTQ individuals at a at a pride event? I mean, if 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 you were going to put the spotlight on anything, I mean, if you if the media, if journalists were going to put the spotlight on anything involving Islam, don't you think it would be an attack on? Uh, the LGBTQ community? Well, it shows which victim group trumps the other. If it were some crazy Christian who had attacked these lesbians and this transgender fellow, then this would be international headlines. But because it's Muslims, apparently the primary objective, the prime directive for the establishment media today is to protect the image of Islam, even at the expense of gay rights, which they otherwise so energetically trumpet interesting it, it is it is it is a uh, you know you, you see all these protected groups and so on and it's interesting to see which is the most protected group islam the muslims are mm-hmm. very much the most protected group here's another story you're not going to hear about uh i uh, got a story out of the Italian edition of Vatican News it's not even in the english edition of Vatican News yet i'm sure they will put it in but in any case, uh, just today, as a matter of fact, no, I'm sorry, yesterday, September 6th, uh, no, actually during the night, I'm sorry to be uh, uncertain about this, I'm scanning through as we're going, we're going here, a, uh, in Mozambique, Islamic jihadis attacked a Catholic mission set fire to the mission, burnt the whole place down, and an 84-year-old nun who's been working in Mozambique since 1963 uh, came outside, of course, because her home was on fire and was shot dead. Uh, This is something that nobody is wanting to acknowledge what exactly happened, but Cardinal Matteo Zuppi, the president of the Italian Bishops' Conference uh, actually sort of let slip what happened when he said that he hoped that the death of Sister Maria de Capi would be a seed of peace and reconciliation in a land that after years of stability is again plagued by violence caused by Islamist groups. And so uh, they seem, although nobody is daring to note who did it, this also happened right on the border of the Cabo Delgado province, where Islamic State is quite active. And uh, it, it's it, the problem with that is, you know, someone's death, which can, you know, sh- shine a spotlight on problems and lead to change <clears throat> and so on. They can't do that if no one ever hears about it. Indeed. And that, that's right. So you're right. Cardinal Zuppi is kind of out of focus there because he's hoping that this will bring about peace and reconciliation. And yet the Catholic Church institutionally actually is committed to ignoring and denying the source of the problem. And so it's hard to know how that peace and reconciliation is going to come about when one group, the victimized group, won't even name who it is that's attacking them or discuss it honestly. And, uh, this, you, you, you know, Robert? Yes, sir. There's obviously a problem with talking about Islam, right? Because no one wants to name Islam whenever it is clearly, clearly uh, <clears throat> behind these attacks. Um, so we need sort of like co- code terminology that we can spread around and be using this, this code language where we all know what we're talking about, but no one else knows what we're talking about, right? And so people can feel more comfortable using the code language than saying Islam, because then we'll be called Islamophobe. So since now we know that, you know, Christianity is the biggest biggest religion in the world, Islam is the second biggest religion. So I suggest as code language, refer to Islam as number two. 
Um, and then we just refer to number two. And we say, hey, did you hear what you hear about number two? You hear about number two, what number two did? But they try harder, Something. I'm told. Uh, that's an old TV commercial, probably from before your time. We're number two, we try harder. Anyway, uh, yes, that may well do it, but I suspect that people would figure out what was being referred to and the whole thing would change again. Meanwhile, meanwhile, David, it's important to note that while non-Muslims are so very reticent about speaking about these issues, some of the jihadis have no such compunction. And in Switzerland, there is a story of a woman who was identified in the Swiss press as a young Swiss woman. And this young Swiss woman in Lugano, in Switzerland, she attempted to cut. What do you think she tried to cut, David? Mm, Great Carnex's neck. It's uncanny, yes. Uh, why would my nose be fake? That's the strangest thing I ever saw. Uh, I just don't understand that. It doesn't make any sense. Why would anybody have a fake nose that looked like this? In any case, uh, yes, in all seriousness, back to the story. Switzerland, Lugano. Woman attacks two other women, tries to cut their necks in accord with the Quranic directive. When you meet the unbelievers, strike the necks. She also screamed something. What do you think she yelled, David? Uh, I got I got to go with my bread and butter here. Allahu Akbar. Your streak continues. One day, somebody's going to yell, you know, I... I I, I love peanut butter or something, and then, then, then it's all going to be over. But no, then, so far, yes. And then the the uh, the Ken Jennings of of Islamophobia will will have to retire. Indeed, but so far the thing is is that this woman in Switzerland, this young Swiss woman, as she is identified several times in the story, she uh, actually said that she had wanted to do something for the Islamic State for a very long time. And when they asked her if she was regretful about it, she said, yes, if I could go back, I would do it better. Because uh, she didn't end up killing them. So she has no problem acknowledging what, why she did this. Yeah, it's, it's all the people who don't believe in Islam who would have to say that it has nothing to do with Islam. Uh, this is a, you know, with, with the rise of ISIS way back in the day, remember, remember this was a, uh, Obama's JV team talking That's about right. that as a JV yeah. team. And then they start, then they start taking over the middle East and so on. And, you know, have all these countries involved in this war against this, uh, this JV team. Um, but notice back then, it was, they were claiming to be the caliphate. This is the new revived caliphate. And that's why you had people from around the world flooding to join. Hey, we have, we have the revived uh, caliphate. And, it, it, you know, I, I'm sure you were thinking the same thing. You got to crush these guys. You have to crush these guys because you can't let a caliphate actually start gaining more and more momentum. Um, so it was good when they actually started losing and losing ground and so on. But then they just, you know, then they just turned into like Al Qaeda on steroids. You know what I mean? They're still like spread all over the place. They don't have this, you know, these giant swaths of land and so on. But uh, here they are still going. So, you know, you think, ah, they're going to be done because what you're worried about is people are going to see them having success, being successful and then run and want to join. You think, ah, well, now they've been now they've been crushed. And so now that's going to go away and it just doesn't go away. And you got to now they're this they're, they're still people being slaughtered over this group. And a couple of years from now, you have some other group rise and they'll claim to be the new caliphate and they'll hopefully get crushed. And then what will happen? Well, you know, they'll still be around afterwards. And my goodness, how many how many terrorist groups do we need in the world? Really? Well, you know, it's important to understand why they must be crushed. It's not just a matter of not wanting terrorism to spread. It's that there is a one-to-one -one correlation, as far as they're concerned, with worldly success and Allah's blessings. 
because the Quran promises success in this world as well as the next, and punishment in this world as well as the next for those who disobey him. And so the Islamic State's caliphate in Iraq and Syria was a sign of Allah's favor upon them. And so it fed on itself, and the more that they held, the longer they held that territory, the more Muslims from around the world they attracted. And it's the same thing. If they gain significant amounts of territory in Africa, the same thing will start all over again. And so it's uh, extremely important to try to keep these groups from growing, but because the West is in near total denial about what they're all about, nobody is on that. Anyway, continuing with our theme of being involved with jihadis who have no problem acknowledging what they did, we have a happy young man in Nigeria, Munkaila Ahmadu, and I know you heard about this one. He killed his parents. And he said, I'm glad I killed my parents because they blasphemed Muhammad. And he said he deserved not to be punished. He deserved to get an award, to be garlanded for killing his parents because they abused the prophet. Now, there are a number of Quranic references to this kind of thing, David, aren't there? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and hadith passages as well. Indeed. Saying that if you have a father or a mother who is an infidel, you owe them no allegiance, you should cut them off. As a matter of fact, Abraham in chapter 60, verse 4 of the Quran, tells his father, there will be enmity and hatred between us and you forever until you acknowledge Allah. So this fellow is just going on Quranic directives. And uh, in, in uh, Sunan Ibn Majah, Muhammad said, Muhammad told his followers, carry out Allah's penalties even against your own family members. And so you had that. And then as far as this guy just, you know, doing it vigilante style, not with not with the actual uh, government, uh, Sharia compliant government carrying out the penalty. Uh, we've talked about that numerous times before when a man uh, murdered the, the mother of his own children because she was making fun of Muhammad. And Muhammad said, "No retaliation for her blood. No retaliation for this. So, hey, you you get a you get a free pass for murdering this woman, because the reason you killed her was that she was um, she was making fun of Muhammad. So if they if if this guy were in a Sharia compliant area, they would have to say a fully Sharia compliant area would have to say, yes, we the government would would prefer doing that, but." you're not in any trouble for doing it yourself because because you know muhammad would have executed that woman but when one of his followers just did it vigilante style he was fine with it so this is very important as a matter of fact uh islamic law specifies this uh in the in reliance of the traveler the shafi'i manual of sharia it specifies that the uh punishments of allah are to be carried out by the lawful authority but if the lawful authority isn't doing it and an individual Muslim carries them out, there's no penalty. And as a matter of fact, there are Allah's blessings. So we have a couple of stories there about Muslims waging jihad and being glad about it. I think that's a good uh, transition for us, David, into the ever-present stupid infidels section. And that involves infidels not knowing, not wanting to know what jihad is all about, having it staring them in the face and ignoring it. I think the winner for that this week in this category is a police officer in Cleveland, Ohio, named Ismail Quran. And Ismail Quran is an award-winning police officer in Cleveland. He has been decorated for his valuable service, and he also used to be active on Twitter. And hey, some no, his... I, I, I have to say, I'm like I'm loving this guy, right? Because it's great when you know Muslims, um, you know, people complain about failing to integrate and things like that. It's great when you have uh, you know Muslims joining the police force, or getting into politics, mm -hmm. and showing 
that they're just like the rest of us. So kudos to this guy. Yes, kudos to Officer Quran. And Officer Quran spent his off hours whiling away the time on Twitter, railing about the Jews. Oh the, my goodness. As he called them, the scumbag Yahudi. And he said, let me salute Hitler the Great. Uh, this actually was years ago, and it only came to light recently, whereupon he was investigated, and uh, the results of the investigation were announced several days ago. Officer Quran will not be disciplined and will keep his job. So, so now, we're, now we're finding out about, you know... The, we talk about cancel culture where, you know, some tweet you posted at some point can <clears throat> actually get you uh, canceled. Uh, not if you're a Muslim, apparently. If you're a Muslim, it doesn't matter. You could be calling for, you know, genocide against Jews and be a police officer. And you're OK, apparently. See, yep. I, I can't I can't I can't even give this dude a compliment without you ruining it. by <laughs> You know, talking about him being anti-Semitic creep. Well, he is what he is, David. Uh Unfortunately, he did not seek my advice before tweeting, or his. Uh, I'd be happy to run his Twitter account for him, but he hasn't offered. I just want to offer Officer Quran right now. I'll be happy to, to take over his Twitter account. Should he wish, it might change a bit in its editorial content, however. Hey, you know, to be funny, <clears throat> be like if uh, they're so eager to show that, you know, they're fine with whatever this guy does, that they give him a promotion and he becomes Captain Quran. Captain Quran, I love it. Yeah, wouldn't you like, wouldn't you like Captain Quran? With a red your cape. police force? A green yeah. cape. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm thinking of Captain Caveman. You remember Captain Caveman? <laughs> <laughs> this club. Captain Quran! <laughs> All right, we got to find an animator. Anyway, uh, Captain Karan, you gotta you gotta consider though seriously. If the shoe were on the other foot, if you had a non-Muslim police officer railing about Muslims and praising somebody who had committed a genocide of Muslims, he would not have retained his job. And the Council on American Islamic Relations and other groups would be saying, this guy cannot be an effective police officer because Muslims will he he will not protect them and he will not be reliable in areas where he might have to deal with them. But the same thing goes for Jews in Cleveland now. And yet that doesn't seem to be a consideration. And, and by the way, I mean I, I would agree if, if someone if you saw if, if someone were a police officer and so on, you looked up some tweets and he's calling for like exterminating Muslims and nuking Mecca and stuff like that. I said, look, this guy, you, he cannot be a cop. Mm -hmm. You can't be a cop because that, that guy has to be protecting Muslims as well as everyone else. And you can't mm -hmm. trust someone like that. It's true. They may have changed and stuff, but you, you don't know that. And so you just say, OK, there are a lot of people. There are a lot of people in this country. We can find someone else to be a cop. Just not that guy. That guy can do something else. Yep. But 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 you can you can be that way. Apparently, again, we're finding we're finding the, the hierarchy here, because if it were, let's say, you know, a, a, a Christian, <clears throat> white Christian or something like that, who was saying that about Jews, they would they would that person would lose his job. But Muslim. Nope. You're you're higher up on the the hierarchy here once again i think i don't think there's any group that's higher than muslims i got another story that illustrates that out of new york city a brooklyn cab driver farouk afzal and farouk afzal was driving along back in 2018 on in his cab and he saw a hasidic jew walking along on the street he swerved his cab to try to hit him with his cab but his victim ran away so Afzal then drove toward another Hasidic Jew, got out of his cab, ran after this man, and struck him, and then chased him into an intersection and is beating him. There's video of this, beating him in the middle of the intersection. 
ultimately, he attacked a third man, another Hasidic Jew, who tried to intervene. So, this is a Muslim cab driver who, at totally at random, gets out of his cab one day and tries to brutalize three Jews. He was convicted the other day for assault, for unprovoked attacks. He was convicted of second-degree attempted assault, third-degree assault, and third-degree menacing. But David, he was acquitted of hate crime charges. Now, the implication of that is that he could have just been picking these guys at random. It just is total coincidence that all three of them were Jews. Do you it, think uh, it was coincidence? It, uh, well, it always is. But I mean, at least this guy was convicted of something. The way the way these stories have been going, I thought, you know, the Jews were going to call the cops on him. The cops are going to be like, oh, man, does this guy need a job? <laughs> you don't... He gets sick of driving a cab. He can drive around this police cruiser because that's how we roll now. That's right. You never know, really. In Australia, we have more dumb infidels. No, uh, that, they're, that, they're, they're, they're starting to become the dumbest down there, and that's saying a lot. When you've got yeah. France, when you've got France, Great Britain, Germany, and Canada on the list, and, and, and Australia is starting to sound at, at least as dumb, we've got, we got problems. Yeah, well, you know, you got the University of Adelaide and you've got the student newspaper and the student newspaper's editor is a hijab wearing Muslima named Habiba Jaguri. And Habiba Jaguri published in the student newspaper of the University of Adelaide an article calling for death to Israel. Not your average student newspaper article. And this created a bit of a controversy. But the University of Adelaide has weighed in now and said this is a matter of academic freedom and the freedom of speech. Isn't it interesting? <laughs> because that, that's what we say, not when we're calling for killing anyone, but when we're condemning violence and they condemn us for condemning violence and pointing to its source <clears throat> and then that you they say you can't say that that's what a horrible thing to say and we say hey you know it's, it's freedom of speech to to talk about that talk about this and ah hate speech is it free speech and that's yet right. you can act yeah and what we're i mean what we're what we're talking about saying hey uh, this you know this thing that that guy did over there it's actually commanded in this book and we can show you the exact passage where what he did is commanded and then he carried it out ah that's hate speech and yet when someone is actually promoting hate speech slaughtering people ah freedom of speech man haven't you heard of it yeah you know uh i can tell you david the last few times i spoke at universities it was as if jack the ripper had come to campus and the whole campus was mobilized against the the wrong thinker, the miscreant, the criminal, the Islamophobe. And uh, I remember at University of Buffalo, the whole crowd hooting and yelling for an hour and a half. The organizers didn't want to just end the event. So I kind of just stood there and got yelled at for the whole time. And they were saying exactly the kind of thing that you were just saying that this uh this you know it's hate it's islamophobia to note that islamic jihadis are using the texts and teachings of islam and it has nothing to do with the freedom of speech hate speech is not free speech uh how anybody draws the distinction or distinguishes between the two that remains unexplained but i can tell you university campuses all over the world now are far more worried about islamophobia so-called than they are about actual Islamic Jihad. Oh, that's a, the top of the hierarchy, right? So, uh, oh, by the way, I, I, I think I've come out with a counter for that because there is this tendency of, you know, stupid college students to shout down anything they don't want to hear. Uh, one day when you're going to speak to a campus where you think this is going to happen, bring me along and I'll mm -hmm. bring a projector. I'll bring a projector and I'll be running a PowerPoint there. And you can announce, say, hey, whenever you guys are shouting so loud that I can't speak, Dave is just going to be over there putting up slides and I'll just be putting up slides from the Muslim sources. And then like, you know, how these things are still being carried out. I'll give all these facts, fun facts about Muhammad up on the screen. And then they're not going to want to see that. So they're, they're going to they're going to quiet down. I, 
at least I think. But, well, but, you, you, know. you got a deal, my friend. Uh, it's been like three or four years since I've even been asked to speak on campus. The campuses are so uh, corrupt now and so completely one-sided. No other points of view are allowed. But if it ever happens again, I will call you. I got it. I already yes? got it. Okay. We, we need a group to, we'll need a student group to sponsor this, but they're going to put the title up in defense. Uh, wait, how are we going to put this? Um, how to deal with anti LGBTQ hate. <laughs> and they have you speaking, right? And you're going to speak, but you're going to be talking about things like, you know, the, the thing in Germany that happened and where they're getting these ideas from. And so, and, and anyone who tries to silence you, you can blast them. So, oh my goodness, I'm speaking out for the LGBTQ community and this college campus is stopping me. They're anti-LGBTQ. See, you gotta. That's exactly what happened actually. And one of the campuses, uh, I can't even remember which, it was out, out in the Midwest somewhere in Kansas or somewhere, but in any case, uh, this guy's holding up a sign says queers for Islamophobia. And so I had the uh, Reliance of the Traveler Sharia manual with me. And I started to read about the death penalty for homosexuals. Just reading what it says. And the whole place starts booing and booing as if I had written it, you know. And this guy. Well, you in, did. You, you, I mean, you did write the Quran. So yeah, that, I might you know, as well have written it's, it's Islamic close, law. close enough, yeah. So uh, this guy in full Islamic garb with the with the kufi and the kaftan goes over and hugs the queers for Islamophobia guy, says, this is my best friend, which I kind of doubt, really. But he was making a rhetorical point. And the problem was uh, nobody was really willing to deal with the fact that these things really are taught in Islam. They, they, would, they didn't even want to hear it. They were pretending that I had made it up. Meanwhile, we have a more realistic imam in France, Tarek Ubru. And Tarek Ubru said something that I thought was fascinating uh, this past week. He said that he does not draw any distinction between Islam and Islamism. He said Islamism is Islam in motion. And I thought, well, great, you know, because for years I've said... There's no such thing in Islamic law as Islamism. There's no Islamism in the Quran or in Islamic tradition. It's a made-up word, made up by non-Muslims, to distance Islam from the atrocities committed in the name of Islam and in accord with its teachings. And here is an actual imam saying this. A lot of the people in the West, a lot of uh, otherwise sensible analysts of jihad terrorism get all self-righteous about the idea of Islamism and act as if those who recognize that it's a made-up Western construct are racists and bigots for noting that. Tarek Ubru would disagree. Yeah, uh, quick comment here. Williams uh, asked, uh, where do I get critical Quran in Nigeria? Uh, Williams, I <clears throat> have sent someone a critical Quran in Nigeria and Amazon in the U.S. did send and deliver that Quran to Nigeria. So it is possible to uh, to uh, to get the mail there. I think it was like twenty four dollars uh, uh, shipping to get it there. So it's, it's more expensive than it is to ship here in the here in the U.S. But uh, you you can you can get it. Twenty four dollars. That's all. It was something like that. Yeah, but it was it was cheaper than I thought to I mean, to go all the way to Nigeria. I sent uh a couple of signed copies to France and Australia this past week, and it was a couple hundred dollars to get them there. But, oh, yeah. If, I mean, if you shipped it directly, yeah. But I think I think Amazon has, like, deals. You know what I mean? Amazon, yeah, because course. they do so much... They do much, they do so much shipping. Of course they do. It's part of... It's, it's, it's because they're in the club. You have to be in the club, David. Anyway, Imran Khan has announced, the former Prime Minister of Pakistan... Imran Khan has announced that he is going to give lessons in jihad to his supporters. Wow, that's good. Yeah, because he said, I have come to prepare you for jihad. First, understand what jihad is. If you don't understand what kind of jihad you're fighting, 
then you'll carry out a suicide attack. I want you to pre I want you to prepare for the jihad of thinking and understanding. So Imran Khan and the Council on American Islamic Relations, they see jihad eye to eye. Well, that's interesting because Muhammad was asked, "Hey, what's the best kind of jihad?" And he said, yeah. "That of a man whose blood is shed and his horse wounded." Right. So he's talking about that the jihad you fight in battle. So these guys are, even I mean, according to us, I mean, according to Islam itself, they're talking about an inferior form of jihad. So do you think maybe Imran Khan needs jihad lessons, or is he just deceive trying to deceive the unbelievers? Yeah, I think he's trying to deceive the unbelievers. I'm going with that one. I think you're probably right. After all, he wants to be prime minister again. He doesn't want people to think he's some kind of jihad terrorist. They have some sort of entire, they have an entire like government agency there just to block my videos. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, YouTube will block it in a country if, it, if it's a request from the government itself. And I was getting those all the time. Sometimes I get like 10 or 12 at a time. They couldn't block your entire channel for some reason. Uh, they wouldn't block, YouTube would not block your entire channel. They had to, they had to request it on specific videos, but it'd be like, yeah, I'd get like, you know, six, eight, 10, 12 at a time, takedown <laughs> notices, YouTube saying, because it's the government of Pakistan uh, saying that your video violates uh, Pakistan's law, therefore we can't show it there. Can you imagine there was some guy sitting in an office in Islamabad and his job was to watch your videos? I mean, I'm the chief executive <laughs> officer in charge of banning David Wood videos. <laughs> now, see, there's a job I'd apply for. Uh, that's, that's a step up from running Ismail Karan's Twitter account. All right. Uh, we have the women's section we want to get to before we go. We don't want to leave the women out of this. Uh, we have some terrible stories, as always. Uh, in Pakistan, there was a Hindu girl in a flood-ravaged area. Of course, flooding is rampant all over Pakistan right now. And he promised her food, but instead abducted and raped her. All others joined in. Of course, this is also because of Islamic teaching, because she is Hindu, and consequently can be a captive of the right hand. In India, a Muslim man gave the triple talaq to his wife because she served him dinner and it was cold. The triple talaq, of course, David, is it not based on the Quran itself? Yeah, you quick, quick, uh, quick, easy divorce there. Talaq is you are divorced, and if you say it once to your wife, she's divorced, but you can take her back. You can say, oh, never mind, you're no longer divorced. You can say it twice, and you can also take her back. But if you say talaq the third time, then what does she have to do, David? Uh, she got to go have sex with another dude. That's right. It's in the Quran, guys. Ch guys, we're 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 not. Yeah, she has to. She has to have sex with another man before you can take her back. If you wanted to take her back, chapter two, verses two hundred and twenty-nine and thirty. This is the law of Allah, as in the Quran. If a man divorces his wife three times, this is why it's called the triple talaq. The first two, those are revocable. But the third is irrevocable. And she can only go back to his, her husband if she marries another man, consummates the marriage, and is divorced by him. It's an astonishing, it's the kind of law people don't even believe that it's part of Islam and don't believe that it's in the Quran. But it is, once again, chapter 2, verses 229 and 230, right there. In Germany, we have a 38-year-old woman who was sexually harassed at the Leipzig market. Four young Muslim migrants, Syrians, on bicycles 
surrounded her, began to grope her. Once again, they were operating on the basis of the idea that uncovered women and the captives of the right hand, they are basically theirs for the taking. In India also, a young man, a Hindu man, 22 years old, was hanged. His body was found hanging from a tree. Sunil Kumar was his name. And he was hanged by Muslims because he was carrying on a love affair with a Muslim woman. Why would that be a problem, David? Well, because um, Muslim men can marry non-Muslim women, like Christians or Jews, but Muslim women can't marry or have relationships with non-Muslim men. Indeed. By the way, you know, that's a, it's evil, but there's a, it's, it's a brilliant system, right? Like if, if, if you, as a Muslim man, you are allowed to marry non-Muslim women, they view it as taking over the reproductive capabilities of the enemy, right? You're, you're using the non-Muslim women to produce Muslims. Um, and that's viewed as awesome, but you can't, you, you can't do the, the reverse. So they, they would, they would, they would frown upon that. <laughs> and when Muslims frown upon something, someone often, dies, heads will roll often literally. All right. We had another one here. Interesting story out of Iran. Uh, of course, I'm sure you're familiar with the very courageous Iranian dissident Masih Ahmadinejad, and she has carried on for years now a campaign from the United States to encourage women back in Iran to defy the hijab requirement of the government, even though this is something that they would do at great personal risk, uh, risking up to 10 years in prison. Uh, but she is fighting for the rights of women in Iran. And she has frequently sent videos out of Iran by women who are not wearing hijab and they film what is going on around them. And in the video in question, a woman wearing full hijab, black, looking very much like a nun, she explains to the uncovered woman, if you don't wear hijab, then men will rape you. Now, that's the that's rationale. What, that's what the Quran says. There you go. Yeah. It's the rationale behind the whole thing. Chapter 33, verse 59, that uh, you cover, you wear, draw the veil over you so that you are not molested, with the subtext being, if you don't veil, then you can be lawfully molested. And so the idea of self-control is completely out the window. It's entirely, the onus is entirely on the women. And that's why if a woman is attacked or molested, then it's her fault because it's her responsibility entirely to prevent that from happening. And so if they don't prevent it from happening, well, uh, there are estimates that up to 75% of the women who are in prison in Pakistan today are there because they are victims of rape. And because they they were raped, they're there. And uh, the, uh, the irony here is, you know, they, they spread this myth and they believe this myth that, you know, you, you brought it on yourself. And yet, well, I mean, I, I guess you... I guess you could say the same thing about what goes on. But one of the things we saw over, you know, <clears throat> in the past few years was the mosque Me Too movements where you had all of these uh, Muslim women who were taking the pilgrimage to Mecca and talking about being sexually abused while while bowing down to the Kaaba at, 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 the, at the great mosque, at the grand mosque. And they were being, you know, they they are bowing down, and someone's behind them, feeling feeling on them, and so on, because because of no self control. Guess what? They were they're fully clothed Muslim women, and yet uh, they're being molested. So you, you you could say it even here. You say, well, well, maybe women shouldn't even be out there, something like that. But well, this is one of the reasons why women don't often go to mosque, 
and why there are separate entrances and a separate place for women in the mosque and why they have to be behind the men. Because after all, what happens if the women are in front of the men at the mosque? You can't expect the guy to control himself or to actually be focusing on, on his prayers with, with inv- some, woman's, some woman's rear end in his face. And it twerking. invalidates the prayer. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends on how fast they're doing the... You know, <laughs> <laughs> it invalidates the whole prayer. Because if a dog or a woman passes in front of them, then... Or, or a donkey. I don't know how... You have all these Muslims in France and in Britain in the parks and in France on the streets and in Sweden on the streets and they doing they're 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 doing the daily prayers. How do they make sure that women don't pass in front of them when they're women all over the cities? I I don't I don't I, I really have wondered this, David. It in, it seems to me the prayer would be completely invalidated constantly. I, I mean it- for real, I mean, if you're doing it in a public space with people walking around, then yes, women are walking in front of you, and your prayers are invalid. What are you doing there? Why? Why would you possibly? I mean, what what possible rationale could you have when Muhammad himself says that your prayer is invalid if you pray like <clears throat> this? And then, hey, let's go out there and pray where we know mm-hmm. women are walking in front of us, so that our prayers are invalid. I guess that's so they know their prayers don't count, so they can just focus on the women. It must be the Dawa idea. And the idea of showing a Muslim presence is is it outweighs the possibility of the prayer being invalidated, as it outweighs so many things, you know, like uh, non-Muslims are not supposed to touch the Quran, the real Arabic Quran, but you can give them one for dawah purposes, so they can touch it if you're trying to convert them. Yeah, same thing in Times Square. I was wondering that when they the beginning of last Ramadan. And they had prayers in Times Square. I've been in Times Square a million times. There are women passing by all the time. There's no way they could possibly have controlled for that. So the prayer was just a show of of the Muslim presence in New York City. They probably yeah, so, would. Yeah, I just want to say, guys, do you understand what we're saying? They, any knowledgeable Muslim, so the imam, whoever's arranging this, any knowledgeable Muslim knows these prayers do not count with Allah. You're getting no special points from Allah for these prayers. So if they know these prayers are invalid according to Islam itself, because they're bowing down and women are pass- are passing in front of them, why are they doing it? Why would they possibly be praying when it's a pointless prayer? What Robert is saying, there's something that outweighs that, just being in your face with their prayers. Well, you know, it's very important. It's obviously a clear priority for Muslims in the West to establish a presence, to establish the idea in the non-Muslim's mind that they're here, they're not going anywhere, it's permanent. So, you know, all over the United States, there are these huge mosques being built. You can see them most, uh, uh, mostly in Dearborn area and in northern New Jersey, but there, you could go any anywhere and end up finding some massive mosque, and it's rare that you are going to get a Muslim a Muslim population that is big enough to justify the huge mosque. But first, Saudi Arabia and then Turkey are financing these massive mosques in order to give the impression of a presence of a permanent presence in the United States. And I think these public prayers are the same, the same idea, same core idea. All right, we did leave off a few of the violent jihad incidents, so I will go back to that. I don't believe I mentioned a terrible story of a young Christian in Nigeria, Samela Sabo Awudu, who was assaulted by five Muslims with machetes. Uh, he was in his quarters at the National Youth Service Corps and was murdered for being a Christian. And in Burkina Faso, there were uh, six civilians, actually more than six, but six were killed when a group that was coming back from working in a gold mine in Burkina Faso 
were attacked by Muslims. Uh, this is an interesting thing to note that the jihadis would rather the country be poor and Islamic than deal with infidels and prosper. And that's one of the reasons why so many Muslim countries are economic basket cases, because you have something like this gold mine that is operated by an outfit called Endeavor Mining that is not an Islamic group, and so the money is not going to Islamic causes, and they are violently attacked with the idea of trying to drive them out of the area. In Iran, you may have heard about this one, David, terrible story. Uh, a woman named Mariam Karimi was sentenced to death after she killed her husband, who she claimed she had killed because he was abusing her. And he refused to grant her a divorce. So, the daughter of this couple was forced to execute the mother for killing the husband. Now, this seems to me to be in line with the Nigerian fellow that we spoke about earlier who killed his parents and he said he was proud. I think the idea was being reinforced that one does not owe any loyalty to parents if they are non-Muslims. And that consequently, the idea that there was no tie that they had, the daughter and the mother, and that any idea of their having some kind of a tie between each other had to be severed. The authorities forced the daughter to carry out the actual execution. Yeah, I'd be wondering, um, I'd be interested in, because, you know, that's a Shia area, so I'd be interested in, because I mentioned earlier that in Sunan Ibn Majah, Muhammad says, carry out Allah's penalties even against your own family members. Um, I'd be interested in seeing, you know, what the Shia justification is for it, since they don't believe in Sunan Ibn Majah. They don't, but you know, in reading, I remember when we debated the, the Shiite imams, was that in Philadelphia? And uh, Somewhere. Yeah, it was somewhere. We drove somewhere. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, I still have the video of you singing Neil Young. Um, you? the, <laughs> the, the, I got the Shiite Hadith for that debate, Al-Kafi, and I've read in it a bit. And I find that it's pretty much the same. There are the specific Shiite hadith emphasizing that Ali is the guy and he's the, he should be in charge. But otherwise, it's really just the Sunni hadith, sometimes reworded, certainly rearranged, but it's pretty much the same content. I haven't found in searching around sometimes when things happen in Iran and I want to quote the hadith, and I don't want to quote Bukhari or Muslim or Ibn Majah, and I go into Al-Kafi, I find the same teachings. It's just uh, a Shiite authority instead of a Sunni one. So that is actually the answer. Al-Kafi, K-A-F-I, is one of the primary Shiite hadith. There are other collections, but that's an easy one to get uh, and right yeah, now. Yeah, Christian Gadfly, so you can... You can I mean, unless it's changed, you can get that on a... I mean, I bought mine on Amazon, so you can get it pretty easily. Yeah, so did I. All right, well, let's see. There are a few other things here, but we are coming up against the time. And that's the one thing that we do in This Week in Jihad, ladies and gentlemen. We are punctual on both ends. We keep the time. And so there is more jihad there is always unfortunately more jihad and all things being equal david are you going to be around are we going to do, do this next week yeah i'll be here okay terrific i think there will likely be more jihad before then it's al kafi is the shiite hadith mm -hmm. somebody was asking a l dash k a f i like a cup of coffee and we will and Yes. Oh, let, let me let, let me just add for those who are asking about that. Uh, uh, guys, this is um, uh, people like me. Uh, most people who deal with responding to um, Muslim arguments and so on, we focus on 
Bukhari and Sahih Muslim and Sunan Abu Daud and so on. So if you guys wanted to do something important, uh, one or two of you learn the Shia Hadith really well so that you can give references to their own sources when you're talking to Shia Muslims, because, you know, Shia Muslims are a, are, are a minority. So we focus on, you know, the, the larger part of Islam, but uh, very important, very important um, if you wanted to go through the Shia Hadiths and be able to, to quote them uh, would be very helpful. Yes, indeed. I don't know what you're saying here. Today is Wednesday. And so I don't know why you're saying Thursday. It's Wednesday and it's going to be next Wednesday, all things being equal. And we will keep on being on Wednesday unless there's some thing preventing it. But the jihad will roll on on Wednesdays. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Everybody nod. It's this week in jihad. We <laughs> will likely be back next week with more of your jihad favorites. Thank you and God bless you.